Don't tell me you're pro-life or you care about the unborn, the most vulnerable in our society. Um, if you will vote for parties that are going to make life not only harder for that group of people, but impossible, non-existent, because they're putting them to death. Um, yeah. So I think that's my first goal. It would be yeah. just to help the evangelical church to get out of bed on this and to to start to see their heart breaking in a good way um, for these babies and for the for the state of um, the nation in in terms of what we do to them. I think yeah. my second goal. Can I actually pause you there, Christian, before we go on to number two? Because I just want to pick up on what you're saying. That I think it's really important. I think Christians are so desensitized to this issue. Um, and I keep saying Christians because, you know, I think most of the listeners on this channel are, are Christians. I don't know. Um, but for anyone out there, as we've said before on this channel, you just have to believe that human life is precious and that it's wrong to kill innocent people to, to be pro-life. Uh, Christian worldview gives you a foundation for that, but plenty of Christians, uh, non-Christians believe that. But there, Christians are so desensitized to this issue. I mean, imagine if a party said, you know, we support the the right to carry a knife to kill teenagers with or you know we support the decriminalization of knife crime um we'd find that abhorrent that party would be dropped like a hot potato no one would vote for that you'd probably get preachers stepping out of their normal neutrality you know i don't i don't want to support any particular party or politician they would denounce it for, you know have you heard can you believe this politician or this party actually wants to decriminalize knife crime and yet we tiptoe around maybe it's familiarity maybe it's just the party we've always voted for we're so desensitized the fact that labor for example wants to decriminalize violence against children and um, killing of children they want to make that okay all the time right up till birth and and the same is true of the Lib Dems same is true of the Green Party I think we're so desensitized that I mean I grew up in a a place where most people vote a conservative, but if they fancy themselves a little bit more sort of open-minded and, and liberal-minded, they go live dead. There's nothing open-minded and liberal-minded about killing innocent children and calling it healthcare. And the same goes for the Green Party. I, I know someone who says they're pro-life, walked past their window the other day, and they've got a poster up in their window saying, vote green. Like, are we, we just don't get it. I mean, sometimes we're maybe unaware of, what our own parties, the ones we're planning to vote for, think about this issue. And as manifestos get published, we'll be able to see in black and white. Um, but if the last elections, anything's go by, the, um, Labour, Lib Dems, Green, and in, in a sort of silent, passive way, the Conservatives are not really any better. It was under their watch, we got abortion pushed into Northern Ireland. It was under their watch, we got pills by post, and so on. But it just seems to me that Christians are so desensitized um, to this. But I wonder whether one reason is there's a sort of defeatism. There's a sort of attitude of, well, what can be done? You know, in my local area, what are my options? I've got Conservative or I've got Labour, maybe Lib Dem, maybe Green. Um, I've got to pick one of them. None of them are good. So, you know, I can't, I can't afford, you know, beggars can't be choosers. Um, but I think something really positive about what you're doing here, Christian, with this Vote Life project is there is another way. There is actually a positive outlet. There is something you can do other than vote for the, the sort of zealously pro-genocide pro party and the sort of tacitly <laughs> pro-genocide party. There is another way. There's nothing to stop you standing yourself. And indeed, that's what I did at the last election. And one main reason I, I did that was I looked at my options. I thought, I can't vote for any of these guys. I can't vote for any of these because they are supporting the shedding of innocent blood. Many of them uh, ferociously, you know, with, with great zeal. So I decided I can't do that. What can I do? Okay, I can stand. I stood with the CPA, Christian People's Alliance, clearly pro-life party. Um, and that, even just at a personal level, I, I at least knew what to do with my votes. That solved one problem, um, but it, as um, well, I, you you are allowed to vote for yourself. Actually, as it happened, technically, I I stood in um, uh, for, for for a number of reasons. I ended up standing in the constituency they didn't actually live in. I stood in the constituency next door, um, 
but you know it started with a personal well, what am i going to do with my vote and it became um okay i'm going to be an option for others who want to vote for life and justice and don't want to put their name to parties that are trying to drive the genocide even further so so yeah i, th I think this positive outlet can can generate something of um, a paradigm shift where people start to think, hey, I don't have to put up with the old options, which are all pro-genocide. Do carry on, though, to the next part of your big dream. That was the first one. Wake up the church. Well, this is the thing. I mean, the the the, the first aim is to, is to wake up the church and to start making this supercharged moral case by which we can't vote for Um parties that are silent or in support of genocide and we and for listeners listening into this we use the word genocide because a genocide is the mass targeting and dis, you know killing of large groups of people based on you know um a collective characteristic you know um and and we, i had this debate with someone the other day you know they said well you know the, would the un define it as genocide well the un actually defined genocide as not just the killing of a particular people group defined by race or ethnicity or other things but they also say that to prevent uh, a people group from having children is is genocide so i would argue actually if if unwanted babies and i think i'm just repeating your own words back to you if unwanted babies are human beings um you know uh, unique living whole um made in the image of god then then to uh, then the category of being an unwanted human being um, does make this genocidal um, and of course their future prospects and their future fertility is being utterly overlooked in all of this decision making so you could almost argue it's a double gen genocide by the UN um, standard you know it's we're not just using extreme terms uh, to um, just provoke emotions here or get um, likes or views we, we really get very few views on the Bethos podcast we, we do, we're trying to capture something of the mechanics and the scale of what's really going on um, so I, I hope you don't mind me just throwing that in there just because mm. I know mm. um, I'm hoping some folks from my church will listen to this podcast and I, I'm hoping that I maybe answered a question that some of them might have had um, so yeah the first thing is to to wake up um, the church and and secondly is to raise the profile of of um, you know unborn babies in the national debate right which is you know even on every level right we are seeking to do this you know by standing a candidate and doing a mail drop of a whole constituency to trying to get on local media but even if a member of your church decides to be a candidate and then is sharing around their fundraising um <clears throat> page with the church or the the prayer group or the fellowship group or the whatsapp group or the life group or the accountability group whatever you call it um uh, they are also putting a real important decision before the church which is okay we say that we're pro-life and we say that of course we you know support babies in the womb but are we willing to actually um support someone who is taking a stand or actually seeking to change not just uh you know change minds outside of the church building on that issue um and and i my hope is that correctly communicated um with an excellent of, team of people that i'm gathering um that we can actually suddenly you know um you know people can find them their whole uh the whole rubric by which they vote suddenly changing you know it's like i've actually mm. got a rubric cube here it's like you know what was once this it just we just need to shift the whole dynamic what the what are the questions that people are asking when they approach um mm. the the ballot box and and that's you know this is the whole you know the faith stuff and the impossibility stuff and you know i can't do this i'm just one guy in my office in southeast london you know this this is god um at work god moving in minds and hearts and i we just pray that he takes my voice and he takes the voice of our candidates and he and he helps to make this a real voting issue and just to put things into perspective here right the anti-slavery position you know wind back the clock to you know the 1780s or the 1770s okay slavery was so endemic in in british culture we obviously kind of took it we took the trade off the portuguese massively expanded it um you know uh, many of our ports liverpool bristol um you know the east india dock and other places were were built with the money of slavery it was just uh, it was just a given that slavery was a natural part of 
um, you know, being part of the world and, and all kinds of theological justifications were presented, you know, going right back to the days of, is it Seth and Ham, um, uh, you know, in support of this stuff, right? Um, and it was the it was the Quakers before the evangelicals who were clearly against slavery and they wrote various tracts and pamphlets and everyone ignored them. It was it was just such a niche political position to take. Um, uh, but, uh, inter- you know, enter the stage, the um, the evangelicals. Um, and this isn't just some kind of, you know, uh, you know, bang the drum, pat ourselves on the back, you know, because actually when, when you look at the abolition of the slave trade, you realize that that their evangelicalism was is almost unrecognizable to ours. You know, the, mm. it, it, it was it was a different kind of evangelicalism and, and it would call into question whether our evangelicalism even deserves the name. Anyway, what they effectively did was they took something that was so niche and that nobody cared about bar a few Quakers and they made it into the defining um, political question of the day. And what's so um, ironic about all of this is is I think it was shortly after um, 1807 and the signing of the the abolition of the slave trade um, and shortly after that with the um, winning of uh, the French-British war at Waterloo, um, there was huge pressure on the um, foreign British foreign diplomats who were negotiating the deals of that treaty. And they basically <laughs> came to the table to say, well, listen, this is what we want. These are the taxations we want. These are the rep- reparations we want. And, oh yeah, by the way, we also... Uh, want you to stop your slave trade and it was kind of the the French were like what like really like that's weird you know um you know why would you do that everyone does the slave trade you know and and so what what you what what you get from that moment is is actually something that was so niche and weird became so mainstream in the UK and and even when sla- the UK was done with slavery and effectively abolished it after a 20 year campaign even their neighbors in Europe were still way, you know, mm. like, you know, you know, they're, these guys are slaves. They're born to be slaves. God created them slaves. Like, why are you, why are you making such a big deal about this? Uh, and w- why do I share all of this? Because actually the, the, the historic contribution of evangelicals is, is, you know, taking the weak things, the despised things, the neglected uh, things and, and making a case for them and making a cogent case um, as to why, um, society should should protect, represent, you know, uh, pass laws on their behalf, um, and and there comes a moment where you know you transgress between something that is very niche to something that is entirely mainstream yeah. and socially acceptable. Mm-hmm. And, and so, when I talk about making abortion a voting issue, what 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 I'm effectively talking about is something that you know our our Catholic um, friends have been going on about for many years. Um, and acting as if, you know, um, uh, unborn uh, babies are human beings equally valued um, and, and actually trying to take that and supercharge that into a and into a mm. into a a, a credible um, uh, a credible political position, which without all the pitfalls of, you know, being misunderstood as a Trump supporting gun toting, um, you know, American uh, uh, conservative. You know, even though, you know, well, we won't get into that debate, but I'm, I, I don't like some of the, the kind of smear campaigns, um, that are put in that direction. But, but the point being is, you know, we, we, it's a, what we're creating is a distinct and new and British, uh, political position, um, that says that the killing of unborn babies is wrong, and any sane person who wants the best for his neighbor and his country should of course want to stop it immediately. Mm. Mm. I think it was Martin Luther King Jr. who who said that we should be, as the church, the people of God, we should be a thermostat rather than a thermometer, rather than just reflecting, accepting the temperature of, of our environments, we should be setting the temperature. And I think for too long, Um, Christians in this country have been somewhat passive. We've accepted the status quo um, either because we're we're numbed to it morally or we're just defeatist. We think, well, what can be done? Um, But here, I think, is an amazing opportunity to become the thermostat. You know, you you get a huge amount 
of bang for your buck if you stay in an election. For, for the cost of, what is it, £500, pounds, um, you get an equal platform with the sitting Member of Parliament and the, the leading um, opposition to that candidate. Um, you get the same amount of time in the hustings. You get the same mail drop. Uh, you get to basically demand it as your right to go on the radio whenever any of the others go on the radio um, in, in the spirit of, 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 you know, equal opportunity and so on. So you, you have an amazing opportunity to put this issue very literally um, on the table, on, um, on the ballot sheet, because people will then see um, whatever you uh, call yourself or whatever, but they, they've got an option to put their vote squarely on, um, on the issue of life. Um, and that's an amazing sort of fast track in terms of placing this issue way higher on people's agenda um, than it's ever been. So I think there's a great opportunity there uh, in terms of the the um, the thermos that thermometer um, dynamic. But just um, just on that, I'm I'm taking a look at the clock here. I don't want to um, keep you too long, Christian. But just on that, um, I'm aware that some Christians still and perhaps many voters um are are apathetic they're disenchanted they're not sure whether to bother engaging at all they've had enough enough of politicians enough of the lies enough of whatever um we've made the case for why vote on this issue but what about why vote at all uh, why be engaged in in politics uh, outside the four walls of church can you give us your potted biblical case for voting at all in the first place you know why aren't we just here to you know evangelize do church and go, and go to heaven my best biblical case would be a potted biblical case um you know for we have this treasure in jars of clay dave you know to show that the surpassing greatness is is from god and i'm listen i'm deeply sympathetic to somebody who thinks gosh i can't even vote i mean what are my options it's between you know sin or sinner you know um and and I also reject the notion that there is any perfect political solution, you know, a perfect reflection of the kingdom of God. And there's a reason why Jesus came as a carpenter and served as a preacher and didn't enter the thoroughfare of, of Jewish, you know, or Roman politics. Um, so so please, yeah, don't don't hear me wrong here in terms of I'm, I, I'm not an idealist in this regard and I'm I'm not uh, looking to set up a third Moscow in the UK. Um, although I have huge respect for for um, you know Doug Wilson and what he's done in, in the states, um, I I guess the I guess the point is you know Jesus calls us to be um, a light you know a city on a hill uh, he calls us to um, you know uh, shine like stars in a crooked and deprived generation in which we hold out the word of life. He calls us to be salt and he calls us to make the most of every opportunity. Now, um, in some circumstances, not voting is an opportunity, right? Especially if you're going to explain to people why you're not going to vote. Um, it's absolutely an opportunity. Um, and the scriptures are clear. Do not put your trust in princes and mortal men who cannot save. And so, you know, it's fair to say, well, you know, don't go to voting day thinking you're going to solve anything major by by casting a vote or voting for one, a new human institution. Um, but so all of this, have, I'm, I'm highly sympathetic to, to, to those who don't want to vote. But, but the point being is um, we're not trying to form a government and we're not trying to, um, uh, uh, you know, be anything that we're not. We are trying to educate the nation on the humanity and value of unborn children and we are trying to um, uh, raise the moral profile um, of the babies and and, and uh, ask a very important moral question, um, which may turn more people into non-voters like you. Um, but but by by voting for us or by voting for a party that does take a biblical and principled decision on when life begins, you are helping the powers that B see that um, there's an undercurrent um, in our nation that that feels so strongly about this issue 
that they're willing to give their vote to it and and they are you're effectively saying you know i'm not trusting the main political parties anymore i'm i'm trusting um moral principles more than those things mm -hmm. so it's kind of a it's kind of a way of of doing that it's a it's a mm -hmm. it's a it's a positive demonstration of life um you know to and to keep i keep coming back to it but you know deuteronomy 30 you know says you know, I, I put before you a decision, you know, blessings or curses, life or death. Now choose life, you know. Mm. Um, now you could say I'm choosing life. I'm not voting. Uh, but but there's it seems to me more active to to kind of choose to vote for um, s somebody who is who, who is, at least in one area right, is is calling for life. And now, again, we're mm. not the only people you could vote for. There's plenty of options mm. and we will update the Vote Life website with the um you know biblical ethical um candidates and parties in the due in due course and when more people volunteer for us but um but but the point being is you know actively choose choose life why not you know it's not um i don't want to barbarize the scriptures or bend them to my uh day and age but but there's an opportunity right irrespective there's an opportunity to choose to actively vote for life on mm. on the fourth of july um and and i would just encourage christians to take it and i think it's relatively um it would be a certainly um certainly morally neutral potentially morally positive um and and also i yeah i think it would be i think it would start to it would it would add statistics to the moral case that i'm we're going to be making from on the highways and byways if we actually also had a significant number of votes to our name mm. hope that makes sense it was deeply potted yeah thank you yeah that was that was deeply potted but you know there's a chance to take it out of that pot um plant it in uh a well a well furrowed yeah uh flower bed and see it flourish um i yeah i think um there's a there's a kind of purity really isn't there in this there's an opportunity here for people to to place a vote for life and it they're not having to buy into a package that involves a, a, a stance on brexit or immigration or gun control or whatever it might be and that's um those are dynamics that our friends and cousins over the atlantic do have to grapple with because that the, the, the there is a pro-life party largely speaking and there's an anti-life party but of course they come with other policies attached. Now, I think I'm very comfortable to say that this issue trumps pretty much any other issue because of its gravity, its severity. But over here, uh, we don't have any major party that is pro-life. And so we're talking about a vote that is just for life and nothing else. There's a purity to that messaging wise. But I think, you know, in terms of my, I guess my my potted case for, for why vote um, is, would be really quite simple in that we're commanded to love our neighbor. That's uncontroversial. Um, and that there are certain policies and laws which are loving towards our neighbors and some which are not loving towards our neighbors. You know, the scriptures say, yeah, what good is it if someone comes to your door uh, saying they're hungry, they, they're cold, whatever. And you say, I wish you well, but you don't clothe him. That's not love. That's just lip service. And in a similar way, don't tell me you love your your black neighbor, um, if you're going to support policies that persecute him or make his life more dangerous. You don't, don't tell me that you um, care about teenagers uh, if you support the decriminalization of knife crime. Um, and, and in the same way, don't tell me you're pro-life or you care about the unborn, the most vulnerable in our society. Um, if you will vote for parties that are going to make life not only harder for that group of people, but impossible, non-existent, because they're putting them to death. It's just a simple application of that central command, uh, which Jesus more than once affirms as, as basically one half of the law of Moses summarized, love your neighbor as yourself. So it's just a simple application of that. We, we cannot say we love our neighbor if we uh, refuse to do what we can in their interests um, when it comes to legislation and, and policy. And there, I think there are certain issues on which reasonable man, minds can disagree, certain tax thresholds, for example, the minutiae of immigration policy, but the, the legality of killing an innocent person violently 
it's really a black and white issue. There's there's no nuance that needs to be grappled with there. It's simply wrong and it needs to stop. Well, that's a better answer than mine. Thank you for doubly, Thank you for following up with it. But you're right. I mean, well, people got, pe pe people got two 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 potted versions there. They can they can take them home, see which one. Yeah, yeah. Compare and contrast. Um, look, Christian, I think we we need to um, draw things together now. Let's get uh, once again very practical next steps for people who are considering uh, whether to stand with you. What do they do next? Okay, so maybe you've never got you've never stood in an election before. Um, maybe you've had no experience of politics before. Um, here's your chance. Here's your chance to stand in an election and you can either stand as a paper candidate or in-person candidate. And your first step is to visit the Vote Life website. That's votelife.co.uk. Um, and there you can watch an introductory video explaining <clears throat> exactly who we are and what we're about. And then you can sign, the, click on the button saying become a candidate. It's a luminescent green colour. You cannot avoid it. And then um, you can read some more information about what it means to be a candidate, uh, information that I'm literally going to um, upload tonight. Um, and you can sign the expression of interest form. This will allow us to have your contact details. It will allow us to to get the ball moving, to speak to you and work out where you can stand, um, get your finances in place in order to stand. We've got a very generous um, donor has offered a 0% uh, kind of loan for anyone who needs um, a deposit up front, which will then help you fundraise back over the electoral season. So so that's the, ne the next thing to do is to um, visit the page www.votelife.co.uk um, check out the information on there and become a candidate because that will allow us to take this life-saving um, information into literally tens of thousands of more more homes. If you've got, um, if that's not for you, but you do have money lying around and you want to help support a candidate, to stand a candidate um, costs five hundred pounds. That's to pay for the deposit plus um, it's additional eight hundred pounds to get all of their printing sorted. So we're talking one thousand three hundred pounds in order to help a candidate stand end to end, start to finish. Um, and so if if that's you and you want to help out on that, visit the website as well. We've got a donate page. All the information is on there um, and a specially designated bank account has been set up um, under my name with m multiple people having access to it um, to ensure um, financial accountability in the join this season. So um, please, uh, you know, go and do likewise. You know, if the unborn baby is our neighbour, do not sit on your hands um, this election. Do, don't don't allow another party that doesn't care or is in support of this killing to uh, come to power without um, lodging uh, in in kind of numerical terms your your disagreement uh, by voting for life or um, giving your vote to a party that does care about babies in the womb. Amazing, Christian. Thank you so much. Let's hope and pray that through this episode. Maybe one, maybe two, maybe a handful of people will step forward and say, yeah, I'm going to stand. And then each one of those helps to get this message to tens of thousands of people and puts this issue on the table for voters where they live and help to change the temperature in this nation. Christian, God bless you. And um, we'll be praying for you uh, in this venture. Um, it's exciting. And uh, I look forward to seeing what will come of it. So thanks for what you're doing. Thanks for your stand. Well, will I be standing? I, I was just talking with um with with Beth today. She's I think gonna gonna take Norwich South, so I think I might have to go north. Um, but uh, yeah, I'll keep you posted on. I'll keep you posted on that. Cool. Well, that's I just wanted to get that in there at the end. I want people to know that the Brefos podcast is not just condoning this, but he's willing to stand with us. Uh, you know, on July fourth. So that's very encouraging, Dave. Great. Well, thanks, Christian, for your time. God bless you. And uh, maybe you can come back on in a, a few weeks' time and give us an update as to how things are going.